Wait, remember Atomic Betty? The 2004 Canadian cosmic comedy that Cartoon Network would end up airing in the United States? I mean, with such a distinctive look, it stood out, but it also fit right in like a Cartoon Network show, sitting nicely with everything else around it on the air. Cartoon Network is where I watched it as I'm not Canadian. Sorry if that ruins your day. Or maybe I am Canadian. I, I just apologize for nothing. Anyway, the show ran for a solid handful of seasons with a great amount of adventures for Betty and company to go on, so it never felt lacking in the content department. Today, it's time to finally talk about this show. I feel like I've been waiting to do so for quite some time, and we'll look into what it was all about, what happened to it, what could have been beyond, and some more fun stuff in between. We're going on a trip in our hopefully remembered but some will find obscure or consider a fever dream in the comments for some reason rocket ship. It's time to go intergalactic and check out Atomic Betty. Welcome back to the 25 Days of Fringe Miss, where there's going to be brand- Wait, 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 wait. Uh-uh. Ah, double fringe miss. Aw, you only thought you were gonna get 25 videos this year? Look at you. You look silly. But I'm here to fix that because I'm gonna give you not only 25 videos, but I'm giving you 50 videos. I have two channels. That's two fringe misses. Each day there'll be a brand new video on both channels for 25 days. I haven't slept in months. Enjoy the content. Or don't. Atomic Betty, your average kid going to school by day and your not-so-average galactic guardian by, well, also day. Betty, voiced by Taja Eisen, is 12 years old and has to still do the typical stuff one does at that age, from going to school to singing in her band to just hanging out with her friends. But something that is pretty different is that Betty is also known as Atomic Betty, this earthling member of the galactic guardians who are this intergalactic group of law enforcement, making sure the galaxy's worst are dealt with. Along with her, on her travels through the cosmos are her pilot Sparky, voiced by Rick Miller, as well as a robot companion named X5, voiced by Bruce Hunter, who together might just make the perfect team to go up against the evil Maximus IQ. Along with plenty of other villains to boot, the trio respond to crisis callouts within the galaxy, and Betty on Earth has to drop everything at a moment's notice to get picked up in her ship, get into her atomic uniform, and use all of what abilities it grants her, from the supernatural to the gadget-based. She's ready to toast some galactic buns. The premise is simple enough to get behind and it gives you a lot of mysteries that build up throughout the show to keep you invested in sticking through it all. And for the all that you do get, it's pretty good. Betty lives in two worlds, or I guess one world and the rest of the galaxy. But her life on Earth consists of her family, which her lineage can tie back into the important details of who she is and why she becomes Atomic Betty. But outside of her family, there is a whole school and social life that she has to deal with. None of those relationships are more important than her friendship with Noah, voiced by Lori Elliott, a kid who is best friends with Betty and has some feelings that go beyond that for her. Their dynamic together is really more of Betty being this protector of Noah, especially at school from bullies or situations that can overwhelm him, as he is nowhere near as outgoing, outspoken, or athletic as Betty, which is something that really eats at him as the series goes on, giving us an actual growth arc in his character from the first episode all the way until the last. His character is kind of a sleeper hit and worth the investment into seeing where he goes. Going back to the Galactic Guard, Guardians, Betty works really well with her two partners, but I think both Sparky and X5 have such a nice back and forth in their conversations and shenanigans, working together the most aside from Betty, as we see how Sparky's more reckless behavior contrasts with X5's more calculated demeanor, and oddly he has the perfect I told you so responses for any situation. The three of them report directly to their commanding officer, Admiral DeGill, voiced by Adrian Truss. He's this alien fish who is very into some uh, inappropriate activities that get teased quite a bit, but as long as he's living his best little space fishy life, then more power to him. And now, back to Fridays on Cartoon Network. Made in Adobe Flash, the show was created by Trevor Bentley, Moro Casales, Rob Davies, and Olaf Miller in Vancouver, British Canada. This group was already well acquainted with the industry, having worked on various projects at different major studios, with all of them coming together in 1999 and founding Atomic Studios, quickly getting a lot of work, being a part of show's pre-production from Ed and Nettie to Courage the Cowardly Dog. Still finding time to work on their own projects, though, they started small, 
Hall with some web comics, but by mid 2000, the first concept at the base form for Atomic Betty was formed. This being a drawing of the character which got the ball rolling. As this was building into something, they made sure that their creative environment was based upon the fundamentals of developing their shows in an open way, letting everyone throw out ideas if they have them, giving the working environment a looser feel with full team participation. Eventually partnering with Phil Roman Entertainment after presenting him with the concept, plus having a previous working relationship with him already, it was easy to make this partnership happen, as Phil was a big deal in the producing world of TV animation, and became Atomic Betty's executive producer. A name like this on the show, plus his expertise, was major. Now it's 2001. The crew get everything ready for Atomic Betty to make her way to MIPCON in Cannes, France. MIPCOM, which stands for this, which translates into the International Communication Programs Market, is the world's biggest gathering for television entertainment professionals, where cartoon and television pitches can be shown off, and these global decision makers compete for them and try and get deals done for syndication to take these properties from local to global. Atomic Betty would prove to be successful here, being the most viewed North American property at MIP Junior, which is the same thing as MIPCON, but just the division specifically for kids programming, beating out 758 other properties presented, becoming the third most viewed program ever at the time for that. This solidified their place in the cartoon space on their own efforts, getting a chance to show off what they came up with and all the excitement from industry partners roaring to work with them, and the early online hype spreading the word to animation fans at the time of this new show coming, and that it should be on your radar. By MIPCOM 2002, the show was announcing more partnerships, specifically with Breakthrough Films, where they would help bridge the gap for worldwide success as Phil Roman would help in being the sales agent for the US. This is how syndication is done. Being announced to be in development for Teletoon, to then eventually premiering two years later at the end of the summer in 2004 for Canada, with the US release following right behind it on September 17th. Now, in saying that, things were weird for the show in the US, as the show on Cartoon Network only ran one season for a total of a year before being taken off the air. Why was this done? Apparently, it was done thanks to changes in management at Cartoon Network. While Jim Samples took over as Cartoon Network president in 2001, it wasn't until 2005 where this itch for live action started coming into play, especially as they noticed ratings were slipping on a handful of their animated shows, and Nickelodeon and Disney were thriving with their live action. You can see how this catches Atomic Betty in the crossfire here, not fully giving it a chance to earn more viewership as these changes were being discussed and produced in the background. So while not at its live action era just yet, Atomic Betty just was an easy tie for them to cut out of their schedule, leaving the series out of the United States until 2010, where it would now be on the channel called The Hub. But you know, this knowledge of the show existing, seeing only what the US had at the time for it, left this nice little imprint in my brain that years later, seeking it out and seeing it in its entirety was surely interesting. This is why nostalgia is so powerful, and why my life is dedicated to remembering things from the past, and why I haven't gone outside in five years. This Double Fringe Miss is brought to you by Gamer Subs. All right, all right, all right, yeah, you got me. It's time to talk about Gamer Subs a little bit. Look, it's fantastic. I love the brand. There's some really awesome people behind the scenes. They're supporting the heck out of the channel, and you're supporting the heck out of them, which in turn supports the heck out of the channel. So thank you. Really, thank you. It's also less than one calorie per serving and sugar free. And if you go over to Gamersubs, hit that link down below. Guess what? 10% off. Use code FRINGE. 10% off. I know you don't want to pay that 10%. So don't. Use code FRINGE. Aside from my personal like of the look of the show, it does a lot with a little. While not having the most detail and some more down moments between the action, the animations there are okay, but there is a definite difference when we see everything kick into higher gear for stuff like the extremely well put together action scenes. The shots feel inspired. There are constant screen splits to give it a comic book feeling, and even with spaceship battles, they blend in the use of 3D assets extremely well. And that's something I can be extremely iffy on, but it legitimately blends together well, and the space battles are a lot of fun to watch. The way our main trio interact with each other is great, having some nice camaraderie, where we do see them get on each other's nerves and pick on one another, but never out of malice, more so in a sibling type of way, where it's usually playful, and they still deeply care for each other and work well with one another. This has helped with the voice performances and the emotions their Flash models can portray so well. Betty, back on Earth, still has to deal with, well, life, and realistically has complications with other friends and 
enemies alike at school. It's both nice to see the show have her Earth friends comment on her just disappearing sometimes, and having Betty open up about her Earth problems and drama to her space crew. It feels a lot more realistic to someone Betty's age. For the creation of the show, finding the right voices for these characters was one of their biggest challenges, having auditioned nearly 80 people before casting Betty, where they were conflicted to either find an adult voice actor to just do a certain voice, or actually have a kid voice actor come in that may fit the role better. Taja was 14 when casted and playing the role of Betty, delivering that performance the crew was looking for. The whole process of making this show was a labor of love from everyone involved, trying to consistently deliver quality across every level of the production process, from the writing, to the round table pitches, to the art of designing the characters, to the final finished product. They had a vision for it and noted how important it is to them to maintain their original ideas. Betty was designed with the personality of two different people, resulting in her Earth attitude being different than her space attitude, with the character being based off of a real person in its conception, but who that person is, well, they chose to leave it a mystery. We get to dig deeper into the lore of Atomic Betty as the show goes on, finding out more as to why Betty, this kid, is part of the Galactic Guardians, why she is generally important and needed, as well as how she directly ties into the grander reasons for the whole operation's existence, with more so than anything thanks to her grandmother, which does draw in a lot of Ben 10 comparisons as both shows were around the same time, but technically Betty here was first, but I still think both shows kind of handle it in different ways. I like that we feel a nice progression with this series as the seasons go on, not only with the look of the show feeling more detailed with the basic animations, but also when focusing on the story arcs that introduce interesting characters, like Paloma, that builds in a new friend and a fun mystery that will culminate in the third season. And for the rest of that season three, we see Noah become more important to the story, going from just this Earth best friend to a legitimate member of the Guardians. We also change up the formula of episode structures, adding in these comic relief shorts as final stingers to the episodes, which is fine. But sometimes it feels like we take away from other story moments or cut a few things out in favor of just trying to end these segments with a last laugh or some random nonsense. They are a fun little addition, but I would have rather preferred just a little more meat on those bones for the story over this. But if it's at the expense of not bloating up the story or just padding the runtime, then I guess it's no harm, no foul. The show really had a fun time with its rogues gallery of villains, having a bit of that villain of the week formula to it that makes shows like this expansive, varied, and entertaining, but also giving us a main constantly around villain with Maximus IQ, voiced by Colin Fox, who just wants to be the supreme overlord of the galaxy, that's all. He also looks like a cat, and I support his evil little kitty ways. His hatred of Atomic Betty drives him to great lengths throughout the show, from delivering a theatrical monologuing performance to some diabolical plans with him having direct wants to take out Betty and her whole planet. He even has this underling named Minimus P.U., which is funnier than calling him Minimum. So the villains, whether small or reoccurring, always gave the episodes a lot of great moments and satisfying battles. But above all else, the show has a great upbeat charm about it, and it's just really well written. The humor injected into the dialogue always adds a layer of enjoyment to every scene, whether it be from our main crew bickering and poking fun at one another, or the villain delivering some sort of evil speech. And there's so many quick and hidden references that are a lot funnier as an adult. Being more understanding of those references, it does add a lot to it, but I'm also looking at the show through the lens of being an adult now, so I just feel it's a fitting point anyway, regardless if something did or didn't go over my head as a kid. But in the end, after three seasons, what happened and what was potentially coming next? And now, back to Fridays on Cartoon Network. In the end, after 79 episodes, the show would finish its run after three seasons, with the whole major final arc overall spending time doing one of two things. One, it wanted to end the show in a way that is both satisfying and harmless, but gives you a fun enough goodbye. And two, well, it did what we love talking about here on the channel from time to time. It was a backdoor pilot, baby. Essentially, it spent time introducing new versions of existing characters, offering just enough of them and their story, that if the attention is there from the audience, then some Something may come from it, just like how Rugrats had all grown up as it originally started as a backdoor pilot episode within an episode of the Rugrats. And that's what happens here. They were going to try and make a sequel called Atomic Betty Redux. It was announced in 2010, a few years past the ending of season three, and would have focused on a now 17-year-old Betty that we get to see at the ending of the original show. From there, it entered into a rough development cycle that really wasn't leading anywhere, and apparently with pushbacks it was getting slated
slated for a 2013-2014 window for release, but as far as we know, it has been scrapped and nothing has come from it since. It is cool to know that there were intentions to continue the series further with some fun future older Betty ideas, but as far as what we got here with the original show, Atomic Betty is a charming cartoon that feels a lot like a throwback to the shows that heavily influenced it. It tried to carry on further into franchise territory by making merchandise surrounding the property, from dolls and action figures to even a Game Boy Advance game that was developed by Big Blue Bubble and published by Namco, coming out in October of 2005. It's nothing too special when it comes to being a video game made to capitalize on a current TV show. It does offer some fun, but at the cost of only being a few hours long. And apparently there was a sequel game in the works for the Game Boy Advance creatively titled Atomic Betty 2, but it was canceled. There was also this educational computer Atomic Betty game called Intergalactic Conspiracy. It surely was educational. And thus ends the Galactic Adventures of Atomic Betty, a show that for what it offered was a lot of fun, and just a cool little space crime fighting show. Betty is a really cool character, and many watching the show viewed her as a role model protagonist, which I can totally see why. I think that the stylized look of the show really brings me into it more than any other aspect, capturing the perfect days of old picturesque versions of what the future would be. You know, that sci-fi look from the 50s and 60s that they were truly envisioning back then? Futuristic realism? Well, not fully deep into what I would consider that to be, it offers enough of it to remind me of that style. You know, stuff like the Jetsons. And I just find it really cool. But if Atomic Betty were to come back with that Alien Force Ultimate Alien Shippuden vibe with an aged up Betty and company, would you be interested in seeing where that would go? Because I honestly would be. But tell me that as well as all your thoughts on Atomic Betty in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe for more. Later.